Welcome to Science with Father, a YouTube channel dedicated to sharing science with you in a fun and interactive way. Enjoy! <laughs> Angular momentum is not the easiest concept to grasp, but it sure is fun to play around and around and around with. Crazy things can be done with angular momentum. Newton's first law states an object will either stay at rest or stay moving in a constant speed and direction until acted upon by an unbalanced force. Is a spinning object changing direction? You bet it is. Spinning objects are constantly changing direction. That's why they go in a circle. So if a spinning and turning object are constantly changing direction, what unbalanced force is causing the object to constantly change direction? Is it centripetal force? Centripetal force, that's right, you remembered. So spinning motion is kind of complicated, but we can still apply Newton's first law. Dr. Smith has a bike wheel with its axle hanging from a chain on one side and a string on the other. He is going to get the wheel spinning, then cut the string. Newton's first law is all about inertia. All spinning objects have inertia. If a wheel is spinning in one direction, it wants to keep turning in that same direction. In other words, a spinning wheel has a lot of angular momentum. It isn't easy to stop a spinning wheel. Spinning wheels are what make riding a bike so easy. Something else is also occurring. Do you notice that the spinning wheel is slowly rotating in a circle? Yeah, what is going on there? That motion is called precession. Precession occurs because the center of mass of the spinning wheel is not exactly above where the wheel is being supported, on the axle. So the wheel's weight and where the wheel is being supported are offset. The wheel's weight acts downwards from its center of mass and the support is pushing up at the point of contact on the axle. These two opposing forces produce a twisting force, which is called a torque. And this torque causes the wheel to precess. Dr. Smith is sitting on a rotatable chair. He can make a complete revolution if he pushes off with his foot. By pushing off with his foot, he generates angular momentum, and this angular momentum allows him to keep spinning in a circle until friction stops him. Now, can Dr. Smith make a revolution in the chair when he cannot push off with his foot or anything else? Sure! Why not? Well, let's see. I guess it doesn't look very easy. Nope, it's not easy at all. In fact, it is impossible. There is no way Dr. Smith can go in a circle. The reason why is something called the principle of the conservation of angular momentum. The principle of the conservation of angular momentum states that the same amount of angular momentum has to occur before and after an event. Since Dr. Smith did not have any angular momentum at the beginning of his attempt, he didn't have any angular momentum at the end of his attempt. He can't travel in a circle if he does not possess angular momentum. Okay, let's let Dr. Smith have angular momentum at the beginning of his attempt, but not angular momentum generated by pushing off on something. Instead, let's let him have a spinning wheel at the beginning of his attempt at traveling in a circle on his rotatable chair. By giving him a spinning wheel, he now has a chance to spin in a circle on his chair. He just has to know what to do with the spinning wheel. Check out these experiments and see if you can guess the right answer. All directions in these experiments are described from your point of view. Dr. Smith sits in a rotatable chair with a counterclockwise spun wheel. Counterclockwise is the direction as seen from your view. Initially holding the spinning wheel in a horizontal position, he moves the wheel up and down while keeping it horizontal. What do you think will happen? There was angular momentum at the beginning and end. 
However, none of it was transferred to Dr. Smith, so he did not rotate in his chair. Dr. Smith sits in a rotatable chair with a counterclockwise spun wheel. Initially holding the spinning wheel in a horizontal position, he grabs the wheel. What do you think will happen? By grabbing the wheel, the angular momentum transferred to Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith sits in a rotatable chair with a clockwise spun wheel. Initially holding the spinning wheel in a horizontal position, he grabs the wheel. What do you think will happen? By grabbing the wheel, the momentum transfers to Dr. Smith. Momentum is conserved. Let's see if you can get this one. Dr. Smith sits in a rotatable chair with a counterclockwise spun wheel. Initially holding the spinning wheel in a horizontal position, he torques the wheel into a vertical position. What do you think will happen? This was a hard one. A horizontally spinning wheel being made vertical is similar to grabbing the wheel. It slows down the wheel but speeds up Dr. Smith. Angular momentum is conserved by transferring angular momentum from the spinning wheel to Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith sits in a rotatable chair with a clockwise spun wheel. Initially holding the spinning wheel in a horizontal position, he torques the wheel into a vertical position. What do you think will happen? Is B. I think I'm getting the idea. But what if he initially holds the wheel vertically, then moves it to a horizontal position? Exactly. That is what Dr. Smith is going to do here. He is sitting in a rotatable chair with a counterclockwise spun wheel. Initially holding the spinning wheel in a vertical position, he torques the wheel into a horizontal position. What do you think will happen? A vertical spinning wheel becoming horizontal is the same as trying to speed up the wheel. The only way to do that is for Dr. Smith to spin the opposite direction in order for angular momentum to be conserved. Okay, last one. This is your big test. Dr. Smith sits in a rotatable chair with a clockwise spun wheel. Initially holding the spinning wheel in a vertical position, he torques the wheel into a horizontal position. What do you think will happen? I agree. Angular momentum is not something that is easy to understand. But we don't have to completely understand it to have some fun with it. Dr. Smith can make a button spin extremely fast using angular momentum. Dr. Smith has about four feet of thin, strong string and a large button. He first puts one end of the string through diagonal holes in the button and then ties the ends of the string together in a knot. With the knot behind his thumb, he holds the string to allow the button to slide back and forth between his thumbs. He then winds up the string by swinging the button in a circle between his thumbs. The string needs to be very twisted for this to work. He then moves his thumbs back and forth in unison, generating a lot of speed in the button. In fact, so much tension in the string is being generated that most of the strings Dr. Smith tried broke. So he is now using 20 pound braided fishing line. And instead of his thumbs, he is using pencils. The angular momentum generated in the button is so large that you can burn a styrofoam plate. Just be careful as the string will break if you go overboard like Dr. Smith likes to do.
You have to try this to believe it. Dr. Smith has two roughly one centimeter diameter spherical magnets. He places them together on a smooth, flat surface. The trick is to make them spin using your thumb and forefinger as shown here. Once you get them spinning, you can increase the speed even more by blowing on the spinning magnets with a nozzle. You can make a nozzle by taking apart a pen and blowing on the left hand side of clockwise spinning magnets. Think of these spheres as two wheels connected by an axle. The wheels are making such a sharp turn that one wheel is lifted off the ground. With the naked eye, the spinning magnets are a blur. However, this video captures one ball off the ground. You can also see that one ball is off the ground if you turn the lights off and shine a light on the spinning magnet. Two circles are seen, one reflected from the ball on the ground and the other reflected from the ball lifted off the ground. How can these balls spin so fast and for so long? I know, this is very strange. Their motion is powered by gravity. With friction, the ball lifted off the ground begins to fall. But as it falls, both balls spin faster. The end result is the lifted ball remains off the ground. If you watch the spinning circles closely, initially you see two circles, one from each ball. The circles slowly come closer together and when they touch, both balls are on the ground and the spinning comes to an abrupt stop. Try holding a large non-magnetic piece of metal over the spinning magnet and see what happens. Dr. Smith is using a column of quarters taped together. The spinning magnets stop quickly because they turn the quarters into a magnet that has a magnetic field in the opposite direction of the spinning magnets. The opposing fields stop the spinning pretty quickly. Once the spinning stops, the created magnetic field of the quarters stops too. So the quarters were actually a magnet for a brief period of time? Yep. Whenever magnetic field moves near non-magnetic metal, it generates current and an opposing magnetic field in the non-magnetic metal. That's crazy! Dr. Smith is making a gun that shoots bursts of air. He is using a conical shaped plastic cup to make a torus gun. If you are going to build this type of torus gun, try to find the largest cup you can find that has a mouth roughly four inches wide. He first drills a hole in the bottom of the cup using a circular saw. Smaller holes generate a more powerful but smaller torus. On the hole end of a punching balloon, he cuts off one third of the balloon, leaving two thirds for placing over the mouth of the cup. After taping the balloon into place, the torus gun is complete. The gun is fired by pointing the opening where you want to shoot the torus. Pulling back hard and letting the balloon snap back generates a strong burst of air. When fired, the burst of air is the shape of a donut called a torus. This is a torus. A torus gun generates a torus when fired because the air traveling through the center of the hole travels faster than the air traveling next to the rim of the hole. The air traveling next to the rim is slowed down by being dragged against the rim and is slowed down even further through friction with stationary air just beyond the rim. The air traveling through the center of the hole isn't slowed down at all and this causes the fast moving inner layers of air to circulate around the slower moving outer layers of air creating the torus that travels across the room. A torus can be seen by adding smoke to the gun before firing. Smoke is most easily added by blowing out a candle with an extra long wick. The extra length of the wick helps the candle to generate additional smoke when blown out. After adding the smoke, Dr. Smith lightly taps on the balloon to generate a torus that can be seen. You can make a torus gun, also called a vortex cannon, with a large box. Just find one with soft sides. The larger the box, the better. 
All you need to do is cut a hole on one side and tape up all the seams of the box. The smaller the hole, the more powerful the torus, but also the smaller any generated smoke rings will be. To make a visible torus with a large box, you will need a smoke or fog machine. Let's review. Angular momentum is like inertia for circular motion. Turning objects just want to keep turning in the same circle. Precession occurs when a spinning object's center of mass is not directly over the point of support, causing a twisting force or torque that slowly rotates the spinning object. The conservation of angular momentum is the reason why it is impossible to move in a circle on a rotatable chair without pushing off on something. Unless you have access to a spinning bicycle wheel, a smoke ring is created by fast inner layers of air circulating around slower outside layers of air and is technically called a torus. <laughs>